Um, thank you all for joining us. I'm Jerry Baker. I'm editor at large with Wall Street Journal. Good evening in Delhi and the rest of India. Good morning from New York, New York City, where I am. Uh, we've got a very interesting panel on obviously what is the hottest issue right now, sadly for all of us, uh, which is how we are as businesses and as individuals and indeed as countries and societies handling the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, the particular panel that we're going to look at right now is um, going to examine the way in which businesses are adapting uh, to the world and uh, we are going to examine the immediate implications of COVID-19 businesses, but also, uh, more importantly, the longer term implications of uh, uh, how this will change the way business works, individual businesses, how we interact with each other and how we interact with the world, how companies handle issues like employees and everything else. Um, uh, I just want to make sure, if you're not speaking, my other panelists, I'm going to introduce in one second, uh, you could please mute I'm told because there may be some background noise, the other should mute while they're not speaking. Uh, if you can see, we are waiting for one of our panelists, um, but in the meantime, let me introduce the others. Um, first of all, uh, Sunil Kanthanjar of Hero Corporate Services uh, is joining us. Um, thank you very much indeed, for being here. We have Edmund Kanoria, uh, the chairman of Fidre Infrastructure. Um, we have um, T.P. Chopra, president and CEO of the BLP Group. Um, and we are, we are, we are, we are perfect. So with absolutely exquisite timing, uh, we have to use Kumar, Vice Chairman of Nisky IO. Uh, thank you very much indeed for joining us, uh, Mr. Kumar. What I'm going to do is I'm going to start with a very simple question, um, first of all, to Kumar, which is how do we look at the um, immediate implications of COVID-19? It is obviously a global phenomenon. Uh, it's impacting businesses uh, everywhere. Uh, and I think the immediate question that we've seen here in the United States, and I know it's a big issue uh, in each and around the world, is how do companies survive this pandemic? We are still in the middle of it. Um, in some places in the world, we're still entering back to the work phase of it. Here in the United States, we've seen tremendous fallout. Uh, I know mean, India is looking at similar implications. How do companies manage their way through to some extent we're going to see that we are already seeing a lot of companies unfortunately not surviving and how, do, how are you uh, you know helping companies what can companies do to enable them to survive right so first thank you jerry and uh, thank you frank and, and the harassment team for setting this up and, and having all of us on this panel to to look at this situation so so you're right jerry that this is not just a health pandemic this is certainly an also an economic pandemic that has hit the world at the same time, and none of us were quite prepared for it, even though for 20 years we've all heard that this is coming, something like this will come. But none of us, no country, no company was quite prepared for the extent of the damage that it seems to be doing by its infection and by the economic damage, by the lockdowns that country after country had to to. Uh, uh, resultantly do. Uh, I think what's important for us as business, as companies, is one is to hunker down, focus internally for a while, look at saving costs, managing cash. That's important for companies. The other is for companies to use this time for at least two other things. One is to figure out how we can develop a new efficiency model in our businesses. And the third is how we can build a zero-based cost model on our businesses. Because when we come out of it, I do believe we will all come out of this. We need to come out leaner, much leaner and much more efficient uh, as we come out of this. During this period, I think it's important to communicate well, including the mistakes that we are making. It's absolutely critical that we uh, uh, yeah. communicate with our folks. Second is our decision-making should be based on science, on social science and on people, all of them together. It's important that economics is, is an important uh, uh, driver, but it must not be the only driver of decision making because it is impacting people. And 
it's also important that we support the resources which are on the front line of this. And then there are many, many resources on the front line of this. So uh, for businesses, you know, as you said, there are many businesses which have actually gained from this, by the way. Business of the kind of platform that we are using, of technology, of communication, of software sciences, of medical sciences, healthcare, etc. There are some who have suffered temporarily and will come out of it, but there are some who will take a permanent beating. So we need to figure out early on, if we can, and how to support those which will come out and nurture those businesses uh, in right earnestness. Thanks very much, Sunil. Um, Chief Kumar, if I could come to you from a uh, government perspective, could you tell us, here in the United States and in Western Europe, we've seen a massive government response to support businesses, to support uh, individuals who've been hurt by the, by the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. Tell us what, what, what is being done in India and how much more they need to be done and what the implications of that may be. Yeah, hi everybody and uh, great to be here. Uh, uh, on um, what's been done in India compared to what's been done in the European or the North American countries, uh, I think uh, one, the comparison is uh, really not called for, uh, simply because, uh, you know, we are, the cloth that we have is not the same, the resources that we have are not the same at all as what the Western economies have. And we are constantly uh, reminded by the rating agencies and by ourselves that we have to cut our cloth according to the, uh, you know, cut our coat according to the cloth that we have. The strategy that, is, that we, have been, we have adopted is that we will work to save both lives and livelihoods. And therefore, what, what was done to begin with, that was a massive program launched, uh, you know, to, to sort of focus at those at the bottom of the pyramid, provide them relief and succor so that they won't suffer, and then make sure uh, that their health needs were looked after. And then the next step was to take care of the industry and businesses, uh, which where the focus was that uh, the cash constraint, the liquidity constraint doesn't convert itself into insolvency. And here the focus was especially on the medium, small, uh, medium and small enterprises. And the burden of all of them, the big part of that burden was expected to be uh, carried by the banking sector, uh, who, were, uh, who, were, who were required to, as it were, uh, extend a you know, loan moratorium uh, to these to these companies, uh, also to give them additional uh, lending, which is 100% guaranteed by the government, uh, up to uh, three trillion rupees. Uh, that was done then, and and, so, and, and the whole uh, the size of the entire package amounted to 276 billion dollars, which amounts about 10% of our GDP. Now. Uh, people have pointed out, observers have pointed out that of this, I think about 1% uh, of or 1.2% has been the direct fiscal cost uh, to the exchequer. But that's also because our fiscal space is very limited and our headroom, therefore, the, you know, the fiscal headroom is not, there's not too much because already the fiscal deficit numbers are in double digits and we can't go much further. Uh, so the idea was to balance uh, fiscal prudence on one side make available the liquidity and the credit at, at, uh, at very good terms to the businesses uh, so that they could not only just survive, but also come out of this uh, crisis, uh, you know, in, 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 in hopefully in a better shape to uh, ramp up their production as and when demand rises. So that's the, that's the approach that's been taken here, uh, which is to combine the monetary and the fiscal instruments both uh, to achieve, uh, as it were, safety. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, TP Chopra, when we come to you, um, it, there's been a range of views about how this will change uh, business and the economy. There's, a, there's an optimistic view, which is that this is going to be experiencing a sharp downturn. But we're going to come back. So called VK recovery. There'll be changes, but fundamentally, this is a one time share. And then, of course, at the other extreme, there's a view that this is going to fundamentally change business, the way we work, 
and it's going to have a long term, quite a long term depressing effect on business and the economy. This is a very broad question. So give us a brief summary of how you think businesses are going to respond to it and how quickly you expect some kind of assumption. Yeah, no, thanks very much, Jerry, and thanks for having me on this panel. Uh, a couple of perspectives from my side. I think the first one is that um, in terms of, I'll break, it, I'll break up my answer into the near term and the longer term, uh, in terms of what I think uh, is going to happen. Uh, the first one is I don't think it's going to be a V, and nor do I think it's going to be an L. I think I, the best one I've heard so far is going to be a swoosh. So I think we're in that rapid decline and slowdown right now. But I do believe the recovery is going to be a slow recovery over a period of time. It's not going to be a very quick uh, a V recovery for a couple of reasons. One is the supply and the demand imbalance has sort of set in. So there's that whole ratio of supply and demand has sort of got knocked out. So I think it's going to take some time around the world for demand to pick up. But I think supply is already starting to pick up. Two, supply chains have been broken. So if you think about it, I think large corporates around the world have realized an over-dependency on supply chain from China. Uh, if you think about it, the United States imports in 2019, roughly $500 billion worth of goods from China every year. And to break, and that supply chain is broken. So uh, while they're slowly repairing it, it, it will still take time to repair. But I do also believe that this breaking of the supply chain is providing an opportunity for us and people like in India, in other emerging markets, to provide a strong alternative to these large multinationals that have over-dependency on China. That's the second point. The third point is I think that co corporates around the world are going to go move towards more flexible manufacturing. In other words, there will be some level of nearshoring where large U.S. corporates might take some manufacturing back to the United States, move some manufacturing to Mexico or Canada. So there will be that element. But I also think there'll be a huge focus on finding large alternative bases to China as well. In terms of what companies are thinking in terms of the recovery, I think it's going to boil down to two or three areas. One is I strongly believe that every crisis <clears throat> has a winner. And I think out of this crisis as well, those companies that can innovate, adopt technology, <clears throat> drive productivity faster than anybody else will be well positioned to come out of this crisis far better. Two is in the near term, a lot of new innovations and technologies are coming out in order to help industry return to normalcy. I'll just very quickly share with you a few examples of how we've sort of innovated using AI-based technologies to help industries come back to normalcy. Today, we have the ability to connect uh, any camera anywhere in the world, get the data out, and run it through our servers to be able to send out live alerts to factory managers when social distancing is breached or when people are not wearing masks or people are not wearing helmets. And we can do this for any camera anywhere in the world sitting in our homes. The second thing we've been able to do is get cell phones to learn how to communicate with each other so that when two cell phones come within a distance, it sends out an alarm. But then what we're able to do is create an early warning system if somebody has temperature so that he can be protected out of the manufacturing line. And at the same time, we can do contact tracing, et cetera. So I just feel that in this time of a lockdown, there's been an incredible amount of innovation that's happening. CEOs are thinking about how to drive productivity, whether it's in the near term in operational productivity and also in workforce management. So I see a lot of that happening, a lot of companies innovating during this time so that they come out much stronger in the, stronger in the longer term. Thanks so much, DTP. And then, if I may turn to you, um, DTP raised a question there, the possibility of winners and losers, as there inevitably will be here. Um, I know your infrastructure finance is your particularly more area, but how do you see um, the, when we, as we come through this crisis, how do you see uh, which sectors, which opportunities, what opportunities will there be uh, in India in particular, but around the world? What are the areas of growth that are actually going to be uh, accelerated by this crisis? Yeah, thank you everyone and uh, greetings to everyone. Thank you, uh, Jerry. I think that basically, as you, uh, you know, as uh, Mr. Rajiv Kumar and Sunil and TP also mentioned, that we are in for a massive change. The change, the way that we were conducting our business, living our lives, the way that we are having interactions with global players. So everywhere, 
the buzzword which we see is inwards. So first of all, we have to look inwards towards our health and how we can protect that. Because with COVID, we have to develop our own body's immune systems. Similarly, our own businesses which are there, we have to look inwards to see that how these businesses survive and stabilize. So every element we have to go into the details. And then in the globalization part also, as we see that with this COVID, every country is looking inwards to see that their employments, the people who are, uh, the employment is not sacrificed, the people's health is taken care of, so the safety, so that is the priority of every government. So every government and every nation is looking inwards. So I think this is a time to basically do an introspection and look inwards towards every area of activity and life that we are living. And similarly, we see that uh, because of that, there has been dramatic change that people were talking about work from home. Now it is now it has moved to work from anywhere. So whether a person is working from his home or is working from anywhere, from office, it doesn't make any difference at all. And technology has facilitated this in such a massive way, which is unbelievable. Because many of the people who had not embraced technology, they have embraced technology in the last three to three and a half months so rapidly, which is almost at an unbelievable level. Like today, we are having this webinar and we are having this conference, which is through technology. We are not meeting and which we could have never imagined even three months back that it was possible that we will be having a conference and multiple panel discussions will be having. We will be having and it will be on, only on the technology platform. So the first business where people should look at is, as you ask that, what are the businesses? It's technology. So if you are in anything to do with technology, with digitization, there is a great opportunity because it is going to grow by leaps and bounds. The next, the second area would be food, agriculture, food processing, because this is something people can compromise and not buy lifestyle goods, may not go to shopping malls, may not go to theaters, but food is something which they will require. And good quality food, which is immune boosters, would be required. Look at nutritious food, at junk food. So today, I was in the Oak is having a problem now because they do not have that much of demand. So I think that new industries, the present industries which are there, People will have to relook at it, see that where the demand pattern is changing and accordingly align themselves to that. Good news for us in infrastructure is that infrastructure is something which will be required, whether it be technology, no technology, infrastructure will always be required, but there will be a lot of pain in the infrastructure sector because everything has come to a staggering halt and to restart infrastructure is going to take time. The financial institutions will also have to bear the brunt and therefore they need to work more closely with the governments to be in a position to overcome the hurdles which they're having. And that is what we are witnessing here in India, that you know we are working along with the government to find out solutions to many of the problems because if it is not addressed immediately, it can become alarming. So these are some of the inputs that I would have in uh, this environment. Thank you, Emma. Um, and I think your point about technology, both of your point about technology, we're all getting used to these various technology platforms that enable us to communicate. Like this. Sometimes technology is not quite as I know we've got a bit of uh, some interference on the line. I apologize for that. We'll try and, uh, we'll try and go over that as much as we can. Um, so, now I'm going to you again. Obviously, one of, the, one of the differential impacts of COVID we're seeing in terms of businesses is the difference between impact on large companies particularly the technology sphere, and small businesses. Uh, again, here in the United States, big companies, Amazon, the big tech companies, seem to be coming through this very well. Hundreds of thousands of small businesses, restaurants, um, small sales, service businesses like Air Snarl, they're all, they're all getting horrible. Not many of them are going up and never coming back. That's really a big issue in India with a lot of a huge number of small businesses in India. What's the implication there? How are they going to survive this? So, Jerry, I'm going to try and guess what you said. Uh, I didn't quite hear you, but it is something about large businesses and small businesses. Yeah. I think Hemant gave me a nice point to tee off from. 
because of the dramatic change that has happened with induction of technology, I think this has become de rigueur. Everybody is now saying, how can I make my business more efficient, more productive, more nimble, more responsive by use of technology? And the second area of focus is big focus is people skills. We're trying to reskill people to the new era that we are walking into, the new kind of developments that will take place. Because please remember, every crisis also promotes innovation. It was just about 10 years ago when we had the last big crisis. And if you look around the world today, some of the big unicorns and also the decacons were just actually born in that crisis. 2006, 2008, you saw what happened. And if you look around the world, these of them have become giant organizations. I suspect some of that will happen again now. So one is the ones who will find it hard to survive. That I think is a good question for us to ponder upon because the social fallout of the massive, potential massive job losses that we have right now has not been discussed enough. So which is why we quickly need to move in and figure out how you can create massive job creation. I think in India, we have two opportunities because we had one more problem of lot, lots and lots of migrant workers who came from the eastern part of the country to the west and the north. They actually went back in this crisis when they lost their jobs or they thought they'd lost their jobs. So there is an opportunity for us to do massive industrialization in the rural parts of India and use the skill that has gone back. Because while we call them unskilled, all of them had worked in companies for six months, six years, 10 years. So they actually have skills that they've developed over a period of time. And in the urban areas, there is a unique opportunity for us to do massive automation, tech inputs, robotics, artificial intelligence, machine learning. So you can actually up the efficiency level of the overall uh, economy of India. On one hand, and rural uh, sector, the different model, looking at post-harvest produce, looking at dairy produce, looking at cold chains, at logistics, and in the urban uh, industrial sector, by massive induction of automation and technology, including and especially in the small uh, small sector. Thanks. I'm gonna, I think I'm having, I'm having real problem, I think, uh, being heard with my connection. So I'll keep that question very brief. If I make it to Kumar, I want to talk about global supply chains. Obviously, we've seen a huge disruption from this epidemic to global supply chains. And companies are rethinking their entire global supply chain. So how, does that, how does that impact India, which is obviously a major uh, supplier to the global economy? How are, how are companies changing and how is that going to affect the Indian economy? Yeah, um, Jerry, uh, I think you asked me as to how the changes will affect India as a labor supplier to the world. The global uh, the the supply chain, as companies May I, may I, may I mention, storing. Jerry, I think my voice is clearer. Your, yours got a problem. Yeah. Okay. He's talking about India's role in the global supply chain mm -hmm. and how that could change with this. Yeah. yeah. Was that the question, Jerry? Great. Uh, thanks, Jerry. Thanks for the help. Uh, uh, you know, before I answer that question, Jerry, may I just say that I get a, I get a bit worried when I talk, when I hear a lot of talk about introspection and inward looking and you know and uh, looking at ourselves first and you know because what uh, what my friend uh, Himan said uh, you know if companies and countries all start going down that direction then we have the end of the multilateral open economic order as well as you know as well as uh, you know people will go back to say you know that th there's no point leveraging and debt is a waste of time so therefore you've got to live with Whatever the cash is king, and you know, and that would mean that the growth impetus, the growth momentum, would just slow down very much. I also get equally worried about Sunil's, you know, continued emphasis on, you know, labor replacing technology and you know, high automation and artificial learning and deep machine learning, etc. You know, because India, in India, we have a very young population which you know aspires to be. You know, you know, in the job and employment, and you know, and I, and I find that maybe technology will run much faster than our ability to skill the people. So I think we need to be cognizant of all those things. And I, for one, uh, you know, would uh, would really 
emphasize that uh, we don't need to rethink all of these things so fundamental. You know, a global, open, multilateral trading order internationally will hopefully remain. Uh, companies and firms will continue to have uh, some, uh, you know, trust and faith in the banking sector, which will come to, you know, which, so that they can, you know, leverage their equity and then, you know, get the higher growth momentum, etc. Uh, so having said that, because I think that's very important, I think one thing that we want to do, and I agree with Sunil, is that we need to rethink our urbanization completely. You know, this whole concept of this whole idea that the more congested you are, and the more higher you rise, the better off you are in terms of creating new ideas and you know, because all the interactions take place, etc. in those in those locations. I think all that can happen in the cloud now. And what you can do is to go back and disperse and be much more with nature, you know, and, and have and strike that balance. Uh, to come into the India and the labor supply, I think uh, is a big opportunity for us uh, that we can, uh, you know, that we can bring back, we can shore some of those supply chains into India. But for that, we have to get our act together very quickly and in a very big way because we've got to get our own logistics, labor, land, and laws, you know, all you know, reviewed and organized as, as effectively and as quickly as possible. Because, you know, we may want to be, uh, you know, a part of the global and regional supply chains, but these will not, these will not come automatically unless we've got these four things which the Prime Minister has talked about sorted out as soon as possible. And I think that's, that's what our challenge is. And that's what the government is at the moment focused upon, uh, which is as to how we get those, how we get more flexibility in our labor markets, how we can make uh, land acquisition a much less riskier proposition for our corporates, how can we get all the redundant laws and all the additional, you know, all the extraordinary compliance and regulatory burdens of the book by changing the laws and how we can improve our infrastructure so that the interest, you know, logistics handicap that our companies face, you know, that can be removed. So, uh, really, you asked an important question, but I don't want to answer it in any sort of a glib manner that we just will, we want it and therefore we get it. The question that you asked actually poses a, a significant policy challenge and also a challenge to our corporates uh, to get their act together and for the Indian government and the Indian corporates to work together uh, to actually produce an India Inc. truly uh, now in the post-COVID uh, uh, situation. Chiefly, quickly, how does work change? Is everybody working from home? Who can? What are the work practices? How does, how does the, the actual business of human labor change as a result of this? Yeah, Jerry, uh, let me just repeat the question just so that I make sure I've got the right one. So one is how has work from home impacted us? And how is this going to impact industry, I guess? So I think, um, first of all, it's been a learning experience for all of us to figure out what it's like to work from home for the last 70, 80 days. Um, I think two things. One is the fact that uh, the IT sector, in fact, has come out really well. Uh, from that perspective, we've been able to adapt very, very easily and quickly to the new work environment, uh, working from home and still maintaining the same levels of productivity that we had before. In fact, in some cases, I believe our productivity is even higher right now working from home than it was uh, working from our offices because we're working much harder, many more hours, and we don't have any travel times. <clears throat> but Jerry, what I get really excited about in this new world of ours is this. The world is truly getting flat. And I think there's been a democratization of technology around the world for five reasons. One is the fact that we all have the same cloud. So it's the same, you know, Google, AWS, Amazon for everybody. Two, we have mobility. So today, in, when we do AI, we can get data from any corner of the world or any turbine on a hill in Germany to our control center in Bangalore so we can get mobility data from any part of the world. Three is sensor prices have come down really fast. Four is high performance compute, which once upon a time only large corporations have had. Today, all of us have access to high performance compute. And the fifth thing is we have people at, in India. So I really believe going forward, we have truly the opportunity to become the worldwide IT hub for the world. So even though we've been sitting at home, we've been providing you know, IT, AI technology for large corporations 
all over the world, sitting from home, help, helping them come back to, uh, to, to uh, uh, get industry back to normalcy. The second point you said in terms of, you know, the impact on work, yes, in some of our larger wind and solar projects, some of that slowed down because of a lack of people and people were in the wrong place because of the lockdown. But I really believe also going forward that we have an opportunity, Jerry, to become a center for India to become create centers of excellence in a few areas and become really number one at it, whether it's small car manufacturing, whether it's in certain machine manufacturing. Um, so I think we should pick our sectors, and this could be a good time when the world is looking, you know, in different directions, to decide which sectors we want to focus on and become the global leaders in those areas. And hey, Mark, again, I don't know how much you can do. Uh, let me keep this brief again. Maybe somebody else can relay it and come here. How does productivity change? One of the concerns that's been expressed a lot is that we're having to build now, as a result of COVID, a huge amount of redundancy, of latency into our production processes for all kinds of reasons. In the way that we had to increase security after 9 11, that obviously has had a depressing effect on corporate productivity, on labor productivity, on overall productivity. How do you think this will change and what can businesses do to counteract that to limit productivity? Yeah, so again, Jerry, I'm just trying to guess the question which you have uh, asked and replied because unfortunately the line is quite disturbed. So what I understand is basically if you look at it, and especially in India, we are very fortunate of having a large population. And when we look inwards, we can look at the opportunities of creating jobs for people, as Sunil mentioned, that many people are going back to their states. So therefore, the urbanization and the ruralization of India and the sectors and the industries which can be set up to capitalize on this opportunity of people going back. Because immediately, people who have gone back to their homes in villages or who have come back to the cities, to their homes, from either from overseas or domestic, from one state to the other, they are not immediately going to go back because it will take them some time to go back to their workplaces, which may be out from the village into the city or from one city to the other city or from India to overseas countries. So therefore, where can there be an opportunity for industries? The industries and the government, if they work together, as Mr. Rajiv Kumar mentioned, we can create opportunities for people where they are based. There can be new manufacturing units which can be set up. There can be new businesses which will cater to those particular populations. Because India, we must understand, it's like a continent. So we are talking about European Union, where we have uh, Germany, we have Spain, we have Italy. So each country is very different. The languages are different. The people are different. The cultures are different. So therefore, this is the time, if you look inwards, we will be in a position to create opportunities for people, for businesses, and for the labor and the workers, employees who are available. Definitely, they will require reskilling because many of the people who have come back, they may not be suitable for certain jobs. So, Sri very rightly mentioned that it will require reskilling of the people. But it is a time where the government and the industry, they have to work in close cooperation to see that what the hurdles are and on a very practical basis to be in a position to remove those hurdles. And the opportunities are great because today, as we say that, you know, People are wanting that the manufacturing should come back into India, like for China. The government of India and uh, even all the other countries, they're trying to see that they can bring back the manufacturing which was happening in China back to their own countries. Because then they will be in a position to create more employment and reduce imports. So therefore, this is a great opportunity for India because we're importing almost 70, 80 billion dollars worth of goods from China. So therefore, if we start manufacturing in India, so we'll create huge opportunity for people, but it requires a platform where the facilitation and the cooperation has to be hurdleless. And that is where I see a great opportunity for industries in this uh, post-COVID situation. Thank you again, Kumar. Um, in response to that, how does, where does this crisis, where is it like to leave India in terms of we look from the world looks at 
India obviously is one of the rising economic powers. We see China, China with an extensionally planned approach has come in partly through this crisis, emerging on the other side, it's changing the way China uh, operates in the world. How does India emerge from this? How does India's trajectory of growth and its rise to an economic superpower status, how is that affected by this? Yeah, Jerry, I think uh, I should, I must start off by what uh, the Prime Minister said, which is that we need, we must convert this crisis into an opportunity. And we can convert this into an opportunity by undertaking uh, significant, deep and broad-based structural reforms uh, that will make uh, India a place where investors would want to come and domestic investors would want to expand their businesses as we go forward. And some of these reforms are already being taken. The others are in the pipeline and will be taken for sure. And India will become a, 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 a place which is investor-friendly uh, you know, economy and a place going forward. Now, you know, for just one example about the agricultural sector. For decades, we've had what I would unhesitatingly call a relatively backward agricultural sector because of the government you know, regulations, etc. Now they have been removed and the, and the farmers have been liberated to be able to sell where they want, to stock and become export and agro-processing will be encouraged. Uh, these reforms which are, you know, in, which are now in place or are being taken as we go forward will ensure, in my view, that when the recovery starts, which I expect to start in the first quarter of next year, you know, and, and at, at that point of time, uh, you know, the recovery in uh, you know, fiscal year 22, which is April 21 to 22, uh, would, I think, be, you will see a growth of 10% plus. But that's, you know, also because of the base effect, which will be quite low. But then the, after that, I think we will get nominal GDP growth rates of 10, 11, and 12% going forward. And, I, and I, to that extent, so what we will, we, we had a setback because of this. The, the, the timing has not been so good because we were just about bottoming out of our cycle in the last quarter of this fiscal. But then came the pandemic so that we have kind of stretched. But I'm, I'm, I'm quite sure uh, that India uh, will see a recovery in the investment cycle uh, starting April 21. Because by that time, the capacity would have come towards pre-COVID uh, levels and the investors would see, and also that India will make a very strong effort to improve its share in world trade, uh, you know, which is at the moment, which has been stuck uh, at a very low level, at less than 2% for a very long time, because external demand is going to be key uh, for India to achieve those rates of growth, uh, which we need to uh, achieve. So I think while we can't, be, we can't claim ourselves to be an economic superpower, for some time to come, I think we will be on our way uh, towards completing our economic transition from a low middle income to a middle income economy uh, in the next, in this decade, so that by 2030, uh, we should be there having completed our economic transition to a middle income economy. Thank you. We have only a few minutes left, so I quickly want to ask each of you this question. Um, it's generally believed that the, the crisis is actually going to accelerate the process of deglobalization, which to some extent has already been in, been in train over the last few years. On an economic, on a geopolitical level, we're seeing countries turning the rise of nationalism, uh, supply chains being pulled back. And let me start with you, Camille, uh, if I Do you agree with that? Do you think this is going to become more nationally focused? Is globalization in retreat? And if so, what does that mean for India? And each of you, I want to give one quick question, a quick answer on that. I don't know if that was a question for me. Yeah. Okay. okay. So I heard something about deglobalization. Uh, so deglobalization is not something that is that is new today. It's been triggered a while ago. But we, there are two parts to it. One is global trade has benefited so many people across so many countries that it's impossible to imagine it's completely uh, getting shut down. Also, please remember, you may have political walls. You may even want to put up fences between countries, but you can no longer stop data 
digitalization has changed the way the world communicates, the way it does business. You just heard TP talking of data from a village in Germany uh, coming in here, but that's true of all businesses now. So I don't think uh, we will go back to where we were 50 or 100 years ago, but clearly this is a short-term knee-jerk reaction from many leaders across many countries that they will look at my people first, my country first, my industry first. Uh, it's also good political rhetoric, by the way. But the reality is for the overall economic engine to be uh, humming across the globe, you have no option but to open more rather than less. TP, TP, very quickly, same question, if you can hear it. Deglobalization, reality. I think in the short term, uh, Jerry, there will be a little bit of deglobalization, but in the long term, I agree with Sunil. The world, the globalization has gone way too, too far. So I don't think in the long term it's going to sort of slow us down. And Emma, same question, if you can hear it. Yeah, so I think that the globalization is an irreversible process. So that we have started the process of globalization for the last so many decades. We cannot reverse it. The only thing is that you have to, it's like navigating a car. If you are driving in a Ferrari, you may be going sometimes at 200 kilometers and sometimes you have to slow down. So similarly, at this particular juncture in globalization, we have to slow down a little bit because as everyone mentioned, that it is important to look towards your own country, towards making it stronger, because if your country is not stronger, then your globalization efforts will be an effort in futility. So I think it is important that globalization will happen. The speed may slow down. It is an irreversible process, so there is no way that we can stem globalization now. And Mr. Kumar, again, if you could hear, last word for you, we have one minute. Tell us, is, is globalization doomed or is it going to resume? And what does it mean for India? If you would, briefly, please. Jerry, deglobalization is not an option. If only because we have to save this planet. You know, because if we don't act together, if we don't act in you know, coherence, if we don't act you know, together, we won't be able to save this planet from the irreversible climate change. So to that extent, the global effort has to be made. Secondly, I think we will probably see, after a little hiatus, uh, you know, more strength of globalization when also uh, the movement of skills across borders and of knowledge across borders will also become as strong or become towards as capital movements have been or technology movements have been. So I have no, uh, no, no fears at all about, the, about this world getting globalized. Also, we need to work together on social and ecological issues. That's critical right now, as the world is, is, is showing us that that's a clear message we are getting. Thank you very much. Thank you, all of you. I'm sorry you couldn't hear much of me, but you heard from the most important people who have the most interesting and most important things to say. I thank my family very much indeed. Thank you to uh, Iran India for this, um, and enjoy the rest of your sessions and the rest of the event. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye. Bye bye.